Welcome everyone to our biblical counseling seminar. Uh, I'm doing the first session, and in the following sessions, you'll see why uh, this one is so important, because Pastor Eric's message, which you'll watch next, is focusing on the framework for biblical counseling, and then Pastor Nick's going to tell you how to practically counsel someone biblically. Uh, my goal in this session is to help you and encourage you in the fact that you are competent to counsel. That's the title of this message, competent to counsel. I think a lot of Christians are afraid of biblical counseling. They're afraid to sit down and to um, instruct someone from Scripture, especially when it's according to their, their specific needs that they're dealing with. But you are, as a Christian, the Bible says two things. You are commanded to counsel, and you are competent to counsel. If you have a Bible, look with me at Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Romans 15, verse 14. We're going to read this, and then I'm going to get into my talk. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. The reason we're putting on this seminar and doing these lectures is because the need in our church to counsel is great. The church has grown the needs are great. And just to give you an idea and to unpack that for you, I started on church staff when I was, um, well, it was January of 2021. So a little over three and a half years ago. Um, at that time, I looked up the statistics. At that time, my first Sunday here, there were 964 people in attendance. The week before, there were 766 people. Just this past Easter, Easter 2024, Three years later, we had 2,900 people at Easter. 2,900, that's almost 3,000 people. And there are, on average, every single week now, 2,000 people come into this church. And the reason I say that is because that alone should show you that the needs and the need for counselors has grown. The need for people to sit down and instruct each other from the Word of God is increasing. But there are other factors that are related to this. And they all kind of come together and trying to help you understand why we're doing this seminar, why we are trying to train counselors in our church and why we think it's so important. So the church has grown in attendance, but co combined now with the fact that counseling itself has become destigmatized. So there was a time when it was embarrassing to go see a counselor to, or to go see a therapist. You wanted to keep it a secret. The pendulum has swung on that in our culture. It's no longer the case that you're embarrassed to say I'm getting counseling. In fact, it's swung so far, it's almost a virtue to say you're getting counseling and to consistently get counseling. And what it's done in the culture of the church is it's, it's not embarrassing for someone to say, hey, I'd like to talk to a counselor. So that alone is increasing needs. Another factor in this is society is crumbling. Society is declining all around us. Uh, so sins that were once hidden and you were able to keep out of the public eye, are no longer able to be concealed. People have real issues today. People have issues that they don't know how to handle, and they're looking to the church to help them. And a fourth and final factor is our church, the Journey Church, attracts a lot of people who are willing to ask for help. We have a very engaging ministry here, but we also have a culture that welcomes in anyone and everyone, regardless of their social status, their economic status. We welcome everyone in here and say, listen, this church is for you. So you put all these things together. Here's what's happening. We are getting a flood of people coming into our church that say, I need help. I need help, and I need someone to instruct me from the word of God. And I'm not speaking to you just in theory. I'm speaking to you as a pastor who counsels people every single week. I'm talking about I'm counseling men who have had multiple affairs and have absolutely destroyed their family. Women who have had multiple affairs and have destroyed their marriage and their family. Uh, counseling a couple who, one man was divorced, and the divorce was not a, a biblical divorce, and trying to help them work through the Bible's instructions on divorce and remarriage. A woman who wanted to be baptized, who confessed Christ as her Savior, but she was actively living in a lesbian relationship. Countless men addicted to porn, women filled with worry and anxiety. And this is just scratching the surface of what we deal with every single week in our counseling ministry. And that's why we need help. And this is where many Christians begin to get afraid. 
They think, I can't do that. I, I can't counsel someone. I, I don't have the ability to sit down with the people like you just described and help them from the scriptures. And I'm not a professional. Surely there are people more qualified to do these things. But I'm here to tell you that you are not only able, you are commanded. You are commanded to counsel as a Christian. And the Bible says you're actually competent to do that. And that's what I want to share with you in the rest of this talk. Two major points. One, you are competent to counsel, and two, you are, com- or rather, you are commanded to counsel, and two, you are competent to do so. So let's look at that. number one. You are commanded to counsel. The Bible tells Christians to instruct one another. In 1972, John MacArthur's church was featured in an article in Moody Publishing called The Church with 900 Ministers, and the writer was shocked when they learned that Grace Community Church, which is MacArthur's church, had 900 volunteers doing the work of the ministry. But, you know, honestly, that should be the norm, not the exception. Because all pastors are ministers, but not all ministers are pastors. If you're a Christian, you are a minister of the gospel. You are a minister of the new covenant. I have a friend named Kevin who came to our regeneration ministry, our recovery ministry. uh, And Kevin has a wealth of knowledge, tons of information and tons of great discipleship tools in his tool belt and he came to regeneration and there was a man sitting in the seat in the sanctuary and he was crying and I told Kevin I said hey why don't you go minister to that man and Kevin looked at me like a deer in the head like I can't do that there's no way I can minister to him and I said are you a minister of the gospel or not and of course you know Kevin's my friend and we can talk to each other like that but that convicted him to think yeah I am and I need to go minister to that person went and sat down and began counseling him comforting him helping him and that's true of every Christian. You are a minister of the gospel, and you are called to do these things. If you have your Bible, you can look at Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, the Great Commission, where Jesus gives us these famous words of, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, you know that passage because you've heard it preached dozens of times in the context of global missions or local evangelism. It's called the Great Commission. You're called to go and to proclaim the gospel and to share Christ with an unbelieving world. And that's usually how it's presented is go get people saved. And that's true. It's, it's definitely talking about that. But it's, it's, it's more than that. It's more than just evangelism. Jesus said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You are teaching them the word of God. That's what counseling is. So we not only want to see people get saved, we have to then counsel those people to obey Jesus. And if you want a clear definition, very simple definition on what biblical counseling is, biblical counseling is discipling people with the word. Biblical counseling is discipleship. It doesn't have to be a a formal setting or a formal meeting. I think oftentimes when people think about counseling, they're thinking, i got an appointment at 1 p.m. in my office. There's two chairs sitting there. you got a notepad, clock on the wall, make sure you don't go over an hour. But the reality is, Christians, is that when you are in the lobby before or after service and somebody comes up to you and they want your advice on something, you're counseling. When somebody calls you on the phone and says, hey, can I run something by you? What would you do in this situation? You just entered a counseling session. And so what we're talking about is things you're already doing all the time. We're just trying to flesh this out for you so you can see that God is already putting you in these situations and you're equipped to handle them. And really, this is the Great Commission. This is what Jesus has called us to do, to teach them to observe everything I've commanded them. I counseled a man recently who said he was addicted to pornography and he can't beat it. He said that it's something that he's trapped in and doesn't think he'll ever be able to break free and so I began counseling him with the word and I just showed him what the word said about moral purity sexual purity but then I started to get very specific with him I took him to Matthew chapter 5 and I told him before I read the passage I said you know you need to um, do whatever it takes to beat this addiction because in most cases you know especially when it comes to pornography you're dealing with people who have cell phones tablets computers, easy access to to this content, and my instructions to him was, you need to get rid of any and all of your devices that are causing you to stumble, and he looked at me like I was crazy, I can't do that, I can't get rid of my cell phone, what am I going to do without my cell phone? 
I said, well, Jesus said that if you're not willing to do whatever it takes, you may have to go to hell. And that might sound really harsh, but that's only because that's exactly what Jesus said. In Matthew 5, verse 27, listen to this. He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we both agree Jesus is talking about adultery, but he takes it a step further and says, even if you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with that woman. And so we both agree, me and my counselee, this includes pornography. Pornography is included in what Jesus is talking about here. And here's what Jesus says to do if you're struggling with lust. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, Jesus is not advocating for self-mutilation. He's not telling you to literally gouge your eye out or cut off your hand. So what's he saying? He's saying you need to be willing to go to any lengths necessary to kill sexual sin. You need to be willing to do whatever it takes in to kill that sin, put it to death in your life, because the threat is real. The threat is literal. It is not hyperbole or analogy. Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to go to any length to kill your sin, you might have to go to hell. Because Christians put their sin to death. Friends, that's an example of biblical counseling. That's an example of sitting down with an individual and opening up the word, listening to their problems and their issues and addressing those issues with the word of God using scripture and reason to help your brothers and sisters in Christ you're commanded to do that you're commanded look with me at Hebrews chapter 3 Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 says take care my brothers lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So remember, we're talking about the fact that you're commanded to counsel. The word of God, God himself tells you you are to counsel. And this is one of the clearest statements in scripture. When he says to remedy deceitfulness and sin and to prevent yourself from getting a hard heart, the Hebrew writer says, exhort each other every single day, he said. Exhort each other. Another word for exhortation would be counsel or urge or admonish. You are telling someone what to do based on the word of God. That's what counseling is. So this is why I say you're commanded to counsel because the Bible repeatedly says that Christians should exhort one another. I want you to understand the word here. The word exhort is the Greek word parakaleo. Parakaleo. And the reason that's significant is because the, the prefix there, para, that's where we get the word paralegal, a paralegal comes alongside an attorney to help the attorney with his work, so come alongside. The word kaleo is translated into urge, admonish, counsel, encourage. So think about what counseling is. Think about what it means to exhort. You are para, coming alongside someone to kaleo, to urge them, admonish them, encourage them to obey. You are literally sitting alongside someone, coming into their life walking this journey of faith with them to urge them and admonish them to obey the word of God. That's what counseling is. Paul told Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation. Exhort the believers. Some of you have the gift of exhortation, as Romans 12 says. Paul says that exhortation, the gift of parakaleo, is a gift been given to some of you, and you need to use it. The Thessalonians were told that Paul sent them Timothy, our brother, co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and exhort you in your faith. I'm sending you Timothy so he can sit down with you and encourage you towards a godly life in the word of God. You're commanded to counsel. You're commanded to do this. But good news, you're also competent. If you're a Christian, you are equipped and you are competent to counsel. And that's our second point. Point number one, you are commanded. Point number two, you are competent. And this is where I want you to go back to Romans 15, verse 14 with me. And we'll get there in just a second. But I want to share with you a study that came out years ago, a secular study. And it was conducted by J.A. Durlach. 
and it was called Comparative Effectiveness of Paraprofessional and Professional Helpers. And here's what they were trying to do. In this study, they were trying to determine who's more effective, the professional counselor who gets paid, who's been trained, who went to school to do this, or the lay counselor, the volunteer counselor who is counseling their friends and people in their church. Who's more effective, the professional or the average Joe? And here's what the study found. A quote, paraprofessionals, that's the lay people, achieve clinical outcomes equal to or significantly better than those obtained by professionals. In terms of measurable outcome, professionals may not possess demonstrably superior clinical skills when compared with paraprofessionals. Moreover, professional mental health education, training, and experience do not appear to be necessary prerequisites for an effective helping person. In other words, the lay people demonstrated that they had more effectiveness counseling than professionals. And so what I'm trying to do is dispel this myth in your mind that if you're not a professional, you can't counsel. It's actually shown in secular studies that you are more effective than a professional. The study was refuted, of course, by the pros who didn't want to hear that people who had not been trained and went to school like them were more effective. So they did their own research. They collected their own data trying to refute the prior study, but here's what they found, quote, clients of lay helpers consistently achieved more positive outcomes than did clients of the professionally educated and experienced counselors. Lay people are effective. Lay people are more effective. And we're going to see why here in just a moment. But I'll conclude this with a a statement by a biblical counselor named Robert Kellerman who said, When we reviewed these studies, research suggested that the professional training, that professional training was not the primary means for developing competence and helping people. Rather, the personal characteristics of the helper were the greatest factors leading to the competence of the counselor. In other words, the studies demonstrated that maturity, love, genuine concern, empathy, humility, vulnerability were more important than professional training. In other words, relationship. The attributes of you having a relationship with your brothers and sisters of Christ, those attributes of love and vulnerability and compassion and care, those natural things that are outflowing as a result of you having the spirit and truth, make you more effective than a professional. But that's just secular studies. What's the word of God say? Well, go back with me to Romans 15 verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you're You yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Paul says, I'm satisfied. What does that mean? It means I'm I'm confident. I'm I'm persuaded. I'm convinced. Well, convinced of what? That you're able to instruct one another. Think about who Paul's talking to. Roman Christians who don't have a completed Bible. They don't have the New Testament. And if they have the Old Testament with them, it's a scroll. And it's limited access by the people. And so they have inferior knowledge to you. They have inferior resources and education than you do by a tremendous degree. You have more access right now in your cell phone to Christian content and resources than Jonathan Edwards had in his entire life. Paul says, I am confident that you're able to instruct. Instruct means to direct one's mind to perceive the truth. I'm confident that you're able to instruct one another to direct their minds to receive the truth, to respond to the truth. And the reason Paul is confident in them is the same reason I'm confident in you. He's confident that they can do this for three reasons. One, they are Christians. Two, they have Christ-like character. And three, they're filled with all biblical knowledge and wisdom. Paul is confident that they're Christians. Look back at the text. He calls them my brothers, a general term referring to brothers and sisters in Christ, a term that does not regard race or gender or sex or any of that. It's Christians who have the spirit and the word. Christians, you realize the very fact that you have been saved makes you competent to counsel. The very fact that you are a follower of Jesus Christ makes you able to instruct other believers. One, because you have the Holy Spirit. You have what Jesus called the the paraclete, 
he says, I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the helper. The Greek word's paraclete. Remember that word para? Para, come alongside. Cleat is comfort or, or help. So the Holy Spirit is not only living in you, he comes alongside you to help you and guide you, to point your eyes to Christ, to remind you of the promises of God, to instruct you in truth. And that's what you do then with the people you're counseling. You have the paraclete, you have the Spirit who leads you to do all of these Christ-like things, who then can lead you to lead others. The Spirit of the living God is inside of you. He is the best resource for wisdom and knowledge and guidance when it comes to instructing other believers. Not only that, you have the Word of God. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit and you have the Word. The Word of God, which is an endless source of wisdom able to make us wise for salvation and godliness. You have the Spirit and the Word. Secondly, he's confident about them, not just because they're Christians. He's confident because they have Christ-like character. He says that you yourselves are full of goodness. Full of goodness. He had a very high view of these Roman Christians. When it says full of goodness, this is not the occasional act of goodwill towards their neighbor. This is ongoing good works in abundance. These Christians are consistently loving their community, loving their church, helping their neighbor. They are overwhelmingly doing good in society. They are people who are helping others on a regular basis. And one of the things that they're helping people with is not only truth from Scripture, but just good old common sense. You know, that's one of the best things that you have to offer people in this day and age. Common sense is in short supply. Being able to tell people practical wisdom and advice based on your own goodness and based on your own experience that God has taught you is so helpful. I was talking to a woman the other day, uh, her husband, having trouble with lust and um, trying to figure out how to address that because the person he was lusting after was a mutual friend of him and his wife. And his wife gave him the instructions that he should, they should actually spend more time around this person, that they shouldn't shy away from being with them. They should actually spend more time with them. And that's just terrible advice. But that's what people do in those cer- certain situations. And you being a Christian can enter into that situation and say, no, 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 let me give you some better advice than that. Let me help you to actually kill this sin and avoid this temptation. You see, Christians have so much to offer people, especially because oftentimes when we have issues, we're not very good at solving them ourselves. We need outside help, but boy, we can tell others what to do. We're really good at instructing others how to live their lives, and oftentimes that's just good old common sense just flowing from the goodness of your life. Full of goodness, spiritual fruit, and third, Finally, the reason he's confident is because they are filled with biblical knowledge and wisdom. They are filled with biblical knowledge and wisdom. They know the truth of the gospel. And Christians, this is true of you. For those of you who feel like you're not competent to counsel, you know the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know who God is. You know what truth is. You know what a human being is, born in the image of God, male and female. You know man's purpose. You know why we were created. You know what's wrong with us in sin and rebellion. You know that our spiritual destiny is going to be one of heaven or hell based on how we respond to the gospel. You know that when you look around this broken world, you know what the solution is. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's the principles found in God's Word. And you understand where this world is headed. Friends, what I just outlined for you there are the most basic and fundamental questions that every human being has to ask to understand the life we live in. Who are we? Who is God? What's our problem? What's the solution? What is truth? All of these things, the world is still searching for these answers, and you have those answers. You know the truth, and so you are more than able to instruct one another. You are more than able. I've been so convicted about the effectiveness of biblical counseling. I've been so convicted that we need to raise up an army, and we want you to be a part of it. I had a professor in Bible college. He knew I had a high view of preaching the word. And he told me, every church that wants to be healthy has to have biblical preaching from the pulpit. He says, but if you want to see people's lives changed, 
That happened on the couch that night. I didn't like it when he said it at that time. But 14 years now in pastoral ministry, I think he's right. Biblical preaching is absolutely essential to the health of the church, but if you want to see people change, if you want to see people's lives get better, become more Christ-honoring, that happens in counsel. And Christians, you're commanded to do that, and you're also taught. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for these men and women who have listened to this session and will continue to engage in this seminar. I pray that you would equip them and that you would challenge them and that you would empower them to counsel in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.